on World News Tonight. Lasting Legacy The barrier-breaking soldier and statesman respected by the world leaders now lies in rest. Nuclear threats. China faces backlash amidst new reports of missile activity threatening global peace. Infection overdrive. The UK battles fresh COVID cases with the pandemic being fooled by unvaccinated children. New additions. Apple releases new tech sure to impress the masses along with brand new technology. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Ada Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with the updates in the United States. Being one of the most influential figureheads in the American administrative sphere, former U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell did not go without respectful words of tribute from multiple leaders he served alongside as the nation remembers his patriotism. Colin Powell dedicated his extraordinary life to public service because he never stopped believing in America. And we believe in America in no small part because it helped produce someone like Colin Powell. Tributes poured in Monday for former Secretary of State and top military general Colin Powell, who died at age 84. Current Secretary of State Antony Blinken called Powell's life a victory for the military, the nation. And in a larger sense, a victory for the American dream. President Joe Biden described Powell as, quote, a dear friend and a patriot of unmatched honor and dignity who, quote, embodied the highest ideals of both warrior and diplomat. Biden added that Powell could also, quote, drive his Corvette Stingray like nobody's business. Powell served under three Republican presidents as national security advisor for Ronald Reagan, chairman of the Joint Chief of Staffs for George H.W. Bush, and as secretary of state for George W. Bush and he was the first black person to serve in each of those roles, Vice President Kamala Harris noted on Monday. Every step of the way, when he filled those roles, he was, by everything that he did and the way he did it, inspiring so many people. George W. Bush recalled that many presidents relied on Powell's counsel, adding he was, quote, such a favorite of presidents that he earned the Presidential Medal of Freedom twice. But it was under Bush that Powell delivered what he later called, quote, a blot that would always be part of his record, making Bush's case to the U.N. Security Council that Iraqi President Saddam Hussein was hiding weapons of mass destruction. It was the basis for the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003. Powell later admitted that his presentation was rife with inaccuracies provided by others in the administration. In 2008, Powell broke with his party to endorse Democrat Barack Obama. Obama on Monday called Powell an exemplary soldier and patriot, adding, quote, although he'd be the first to acknowledge that he didn't get every call right, his actions reflected what he believed was best for America and the people he served. Powell died of complications from COVID-19. He had previously been diagnosed with multiple myeloma, a blood cancer that was in remission, and early-stage Parkinson's disease. The blood cancer reduces the body's ability to fight infection and puts people at higher risk for severe COVID. In a brief statement, the Powell family said he had been fully vaccinated and thanked the staff at the Walter Reed Medical Center who treated him. Former U.S. President Donald Trump has stated that he was pleased to have testified by a video in compliance to the allegations of assault occurring in 2015, with lawyers supporting the protesters claiming that the case will continue till justice is served. Former President Donald Trump testified under oath on Monday for a videotaped deposition at Trump Tower, where protesters who have brought a civil lawsuit against Trump allege they were assaulted by his security team in 2015. Stop him! Attorney Benjamin Dichter represents the protesters who brought the lawsuit. We examined Mr. Trump concerning a variety of issues, including statements he has made at various campaign events and rallies uh, that council believes encouraged violence at those events or encouraged security guards to engage in violence 
for the confiscation of property. The plaintiffs allege Trump security guards attacked them on the sidewalk outside Trump Tower in Manhattan as they demonstrated over the then presidential candidate's comments that Mexican immigrants were criminals and rapists. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. This is an important matter because everybody here is a New Yorker and New Yorkers know that the public sidewalks are sacred. Just because someone's name is on the building does not mean that they get to dictate what happens on the public sidewalk. Trump said in a statement he was pleased to have provided testimony in the case, writing, quote, After years of litigation, I was pleased to have had the opportunity to tell my side of this ridiculous story. Just one more example of baseless harassment of your favorite president. Trump faces several civil lawsuits over conduct from before and during his presidency. He is also expected to undergo questioning in a defamation lawsuit filed by a former contestant on The Apprentice in December. Adding to the already mounting tensions between the U.S. and China, Beijing has reportedly tested a nuclear-capable hypersonic missile. China also seemingly managed to plan the launch without alerting U.S. intelligence agencies. Thanks for asking the question, but I'm not going to comment on those specific reports. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin on Monday declined to comment directly on a report that China had tested a nuclear-capable hypersonic missile, saying only that Washington had an eye on Beijing's efforts to build advanced weapons. We watch closely China's development of, uh, of uh, armament and, and advanced capabilities uh, and systems that will only increase uh, tensions in the region. Financial Times reported over the weekend that China tested a hypersonic missile in August showing a capability that caught U.S. intelligence by surprise, citing five unnamed sources. On Monday, U.S. disarmament ambassador Robert Wood told reporters in Geneva he was concerned about what China is doing on hypersonic missiles, adding, quote, we just don't know how we can defend against that type of technology. Neither does China or Russia. Hypersonic weapons are difficult to defend against because they fly at lower altitudes than ballistic missiles, but can achieve more than five times the speed of sound, robbing adversaries of reaction time and traditional defeat mechanisms. Earlier on Monday, the Chinese Foreign Ministry denied the report from the Financial Times, saying it was a space vehicle, not a missile. The report said the Chinese military launched a rocket carrying a hypersonic glide vehicle that flew through low-orbit space circling the globe before speeding toward its target, which it missed by about two dozen miles. But the report citing people briefed on the intelligence said the test showed that China had made astounding progress on hypersonic weapons and was far more advanced than U.S. officials realized. The United States and Russia are also developing hypersonic missiles, and last month North Korea said it had test-fired a newly developed hypersonic missile, though experts said the test was likely a failure. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson vowed that democracy would conquer acts of evil as emotional MPs lauded their colleague David Amos after he was stabbed to death while meeting constituents. Prime Minister Boris Johnson and the leader of the opposition Keir Starmer walk side by side as members of parliament enter church to pay their respects to their late colleague. Four days after David Amos was stabbed to death, MPs are still in shock. Back in the House of Commons, Boris Johnson remembered the representative of South End West as a discreet and dedicated politician, one of Britain's longest serving members of parliament. He was not a man in awe of this chamber, nor a man who sought uh, patronage or advancement. He simply wanted to serve the people of Essex, first in Basildon, then in South End. And it was in the act of serving his constituents that he was so cruelly killed. Meanwhile, members of Amos's family gathered outside the church where he'd been meeting with members of his constituency before the attack unfolded. Investigators are still trying to determine whether the 25-year-old man suspected of carrying out the assault was motivated by Islamist extremism. The murder has revived the debates surrounding lawmakers' security. Five years ago, Joe Cox was assassinated outside a library by a right-wing extremist ahead of the vote on Brexit. MPs have received a number of death threats these past years, including over the weekend. We have some good news for you. 
The government of South Korea aims to cut carbon emissions by 40% by the year 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. After cabinet approval next week, the country will announce the next target at the November UN Climate Change Conference. South Korea's carbon reduction target of 40% by 2030 reflects the country's strong determination to achieve carbon neutrality and its sense of responsibility as a member of the international community. That's according to President Moon Jae-in Monday as the country finalized its blueprint for zero-out emissions by 2050. The new target, known as a nationally determined contribution, is a dramatic hike from the current goal of a 26.3 percent drop from 2018 levels, the year the country's emissions peaked. Moon said that it's an ambitious target, noting the concerns of industry and labor about whether the country can manage, especially as the manufacturing sector takes up a large portion of the country's industrial structure. In fact, South Korea needs to reduce its emissions by over 4 percent a year on average until 2030, which is about twice as much as countries whose emissions peaked earlier in the 1990s or 2000s. The government on Monday also finalized two scenarios for net zero carbon emissions by the year 2050 to give the country flexibility given that conditions can change, focusing on developing and expanding sources for carbon absorption. The president noted that over 10 billion U.S. dollars has been earmarked from next year's budget for the initiative. Moon pointed out the need for a transition to renewable energy and to supply more electric and hydrogen-powered cars. Monday's proposal will be subject to cabinet approval next week, after which South Korea will announce at the U.N. Climate Change Conference in Glasgow in November. The latest on the COVID crisis right after this break, you're watching World News. Welcome back. The European Union's medicines regulator said it has started evaluating the use of Pfizer and BioNTech's COVID-19 vaccine in children between the ages of 5 and 11. For more on this, we have other than a World News Special Correspondent Prashani Rodrigo reporting from Helsinki in Finland. Prashani. Yes, Shanali. Pfizer and its German partner BioNTech last week submitted data that supports the use of their mRNA vaccine for young children. The vaccine was found to induce a strong immune response in 5 to 11 year olds in a clinical trial of 2,268 participants. The European Medicines Agency said it will review data related to the vaccine known as community, including results from an ongoing clinical study. The vaccine is currently not allowed for that age group. It has, however, been authorized for use in children over the ages of 12 in both the United States and the European Union. While children are less susceptible to the severe COVID-19, they can spread the virus to others, including vulnerable populations more at risk of severe illness. The EMA Human Medicines Committee's opinion will be forwarded to the European Commission, which will issue a final decision on the matter. Back to you, Shenali. All right, thank you. That was Adi Derena World News Special Correspondent Prashani Rodrigo reporting from Helsinki in Finland. The spread of COVID-19 among children in England is falling, a recent rise in cases nationally and causing concern among some scientists that vaccines are being rolled out in schools too slowly, risking the welfare of children and adults alike. For more on this, let's cross over to Adi Derena World News Special Correspondent Malshi Abeseker reporting from Norwich in the UK. Malshi. Yes, Shanali, COVID-19 cases in Britain as a whole are much higher than in other European countries and are rising. A survey suggested prevalence was at its highest level since January, with 8% of secondary school children infected. Vaccination rates in England are lagging those in many European countries and even Scotland, and which some scientists have attributed to mixed messaging around shots for children a delayed start and an inflexible approach to the rollout. Last month, Britain's chief medical officers recommended that children aged 12 to 15 years old should be offered a COVID-19 vaccine to help reduce disruption to their education. The health service had a target of offering all children by the school half-term break, which starts next week. The government is considering allowing children aged 12 to 15 to also get vaccination in walk-in clinics in England, saying they will be unveiled in weeks. Back to you, Shanali. 
Thank you. And that was Adi Daranobalian Special Correspondent Malshia Beseker reporting from Norwich in the United Kingdom. Indigenous communities from Ecuador's Amazon sued the government to halt plans by President Lasso to increase oil development in the country. Chanting our rainforest is not for sale. Indigenous communities from Ecuador's Amazon rainforest gathered outside the constitutional court on Monday as they've filed against the government's plan to expand the country's oil industry. President Guillermo Lasso issued two decrees earlier this year to expand oil blocks and jungles and attract more foreign investment for mining projects. The conservative ex-banker seeks to bump up oil production to 1 million barrels per day by the end of his term in 2025. Lasso also wants to turn mining into one of the country's top income sources. His plans have infuriated the Amazon's indigenous communities who call them policies of death for the region's abundant biodiversity. Ecuador's energy ministry did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Meanwhile, various groups plan to file a separate lawsuit against the mining decree. China could not avoid a slowdown in its economic growth as it struggles with unfavorable factors like energy shortages and Evergrande's debt crisis. Its GDP growth for the third quarter's dropped below the 5% mark. It's been largely expected. China's economic growth slowed in the third quarter, taking a hit from both internal and external factors. According to China's National Bureau of Statistics on Monday, the world's second largest economy expanded by 4.9% on year in the past three months. That's well down on the staggering 18.3% on year jump in the first quarter and around 8% growth in the second quarter. But such a drop is not surprising. China has been suffering a downturn in the real estate market amid Evergrande's debt crisis and has also seen nationwide power outages. Surging prices of raw materials globally also added to the list of worries. Based on these factors, Reuters had forecast China's Q3 GDP to grow 5.2 percent and Bloomberg 5 percent. Earlier, global institutes also caught their 2021 economic forecast for the country. Goldman Sachs has revised down its growth forecast to 7.8 percent from its previous 8.2, saying that the energy crisis poses significant downside pressures and affects 44 percent of China's industrial activity. Although growth of over 8 percent within this year is becoming more of a distant goal, Beijing remains calm that it could still achieve its official GDP goal of 6 percent. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A big report of the so-called Corona Blues. A study has shown the pandemic has led to a rise in people undergoing treatment for depression and insomnia in South Korea. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken met with the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency in Washington where the Iran nuclear talks was high on the agenda. The Chinese mainland reported nine new locally transmitted COVID-19 cases, five in Shanxi, two in Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region and one each in Hunan Province and Ningxia Hui in Autonomous Region. African countries want a new system to track funding from wealthy nations that are failing to meet a $100 billion annual target to help the developing world tackle climate change. The Japanese government said a group of 10 naval vessels from China and Russia sailed through a strait separating Japan's main island and its northern island of Hokkaido. And finally tonight, it may be the time to visit the Apple Store as the company is stepping up its game yet again with the brand new models of MacBook and AirPods, complete with the company's very own silicon chips that rival ever-progressing companies like Intel. Apple unveiled its latest products Monday, including two new MacBook Pro models that use in-house Apple silicon chips, a new generation of AirPods and a $5 per month music streaming service. The new 14 and 16 inch laptops eliminated the touch bar and restored several connectors, including the company's MagSafe power connector that had disappeared in recent years, angering some of the company's users. Apple said the 14 inch model will start at $19.99 and the 16 inch model will start at $24.99. Both computers will start shipping next week. M1 Pro and M1 Max represent a huge leap forward. In Apple's two new high powered chips are called the M1 Pro and M1 Max. 
The chips are meant to have better performance than the company's previous M1 chips, but do so while using less power than rival chips from firms like Intel and Advanced Micro Devices. Before Monday, Apple's most powerful laptops relied on chips from Intel. These are the new AirPods with spatial audio. The new AirPods are sweat and water resistant and will have some improved sound features. Apple said the new AirPods will cost $179 and start shipping next week. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shinali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.